Vicky, can I just check that everybody's been let in from the lobby? Yes, everybody is in and I've just started recording so people are aware of that. Lovely. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for, for joining us. My name is Polly Edmonds and I am chair of the Palliative Medicine um, Specialty Advisory Committee at the College of Physicians. So we're the committee that oversees um, curriculum and training nationally. So we just thought it would be useful to touch base with some of you that may be wanting to find out a little bit more about palliative medicine training, especially as we've now moved to being um, dual training with internal medicine, um, just in advance of this this recruitment round that is just about just started just is a, just open I should say um, and um, close I think the application window closes in December so what we're going to so just in terms of some housekeeping today um, if you can all try and turn your cameras off and mute your microphones um, just so we don't have too much background noise that would be fantastic um, please write your questions in the chat my colleague Fiona is going to be keeping an eye on the chat um, and we'll be kind of grouping questions together and we're planning to do a sort of question and answer session um, after a few of us have spoken so please do write any questions down as soon as they pop into your head um, and we'll try and then come back to them later. So what are we going to cover today? So I'm just going to set the scene for you, just talk a little bit about um, the palliative medicine curriculum and what training uh, now looks like. Um, we're going, we've got um, a perspective from um, a couple of our um, doctors already in palliative medicine training about what dual training is like for them. Um, my Several of my colleagues are then going to talk about what it's been like being a consultant, reflecting on a varied career, what it's like currently being a consultant in palliative medicine, um, and Hannah is going to talk about what we see um, consultant roles of the future being like. And we're hoping we'll get all that done in approximately 30 minutes so we can then pick up um, questions after that. Um, so that is the plan for today. So as I said, please write your questions in the chat. So I'm going to start off talking about palliative medicine um, and I guess what is what is palliative medicine and why might you choose it? So um, we in palliative medicine work uh, very much as part of multidisciplinary palliative care teams with specialist doctors, nurses, therapists, social workers and so on. And I think we would say that we deliver holistic and diverse clinical care to a very wide range of patients. We tend to try and have a really individualised approach focused on problem solving and taking into account people's physical, emotional and the spiritual dimensions of their care so that all of these areas are equally addressed. And what's really unique about palliative medicine is that we're practising across all care settings. So some of us are working in hospices, some working in the community, some working in hospitals, and a lot of us are working across settings. So we'll have different settings within our working week. Um, and because we're working in different settings and often working in an advisory role outside of hospice, we're working really closely with other teams in primary care and in secondary care to best support patients and to optimise their living before they die. This means that consultant careers in palliative medicine are enormously flexible and offer lots of opportunities for um, what we might call a portfolio career. So many of us have taken on, taken on leadership and service development responsibilities as consultants. Many of us have been involved in education, research and policy work alongside really diverse clinical work in different clinical settings. So, Something that we are asked very frequently is why has palliative medicine moved to being a group one specialty dual training with internal medicine? Well, I mean, I could probably spend all day talking to you about that, but but in a nutshell, it's because palliative care, care in all settings is becoming much more complex. In other words, the patients that we're seeing is becoming more complex. So it's really changed from my first days as registrar when we were predominantly seeing people with advanced cancer. And we're now increasingly looking after people with multiple long term conditions, with frailty, with advanced dementia, and they may have cancer as well. People are also living longer with life limiting illness, and this is leading to them having more complex supportive and palliative care needs for which we are needing to provide expertise. 
And alongside that, there are increasing treatment options. Um, and we're also, certainly I work in a hospital, and we're often helping support the multi-system complications people are experiencing from treatment. So the reason that more specialties are moving to, to be dual training with internal medicine is so that we better meet the changing population need, because we know that the population is changing, it's aging, people are living more with more, more long-term conditions. So that's really relevant for how we manage and deliver palliative care in the future. So we want our doctors to have enhanced medical skills that are going to enable them to deliver services to best meet patient needs in all settings in the future. So we're not expecting everybody to work in a hospital. We still are going to need consultants in community, in hospice, but we all need to be upskilled in, our, in medicine to be able to deliver the best care. So I'm going to talk to you just a little bit about how we're going to integrate palliative medicine training with internal medicine. So the internal medicine component of training gives people experience of patient management in other medical specialties. So that may be acute medicine, that may be other medical specialties and encompassing general internal medicine. Okay, and so what did say. generic what? and internal medicine capabilities can be acquired both during specialty training and in placements labelled as internal medicine. So there's an enormous amount of transferable skills. So when a doctor is working in palliative medicine, they'll be doing quite a lot of general medicine and vice versa. Um, we have also been trying to, in developing the, tra the integrated training programme, think really hard about how we support trainees to keep in touch both ways. So whilst you're working in palliative medicine, how do you keep in touch from a general internal medicine perspective and vice versa? And certainly for those of you that are going to be working in palliative medicine placements, keeping in touch with the acute setting is really critical. And there are a variety of ways in which we feel we're going to be able to deliver that. And we're really happy to talk through the detail of that more in the questions later, if that's that's relevant. So there are a range of models in which we're going to deliver this dual training, trying to interweave the palliative medicine and the internal medicine experience so that people can develop their capabilities um, throughout their training programmes. And we're, we're hoping that we're going to be able to build local links to ease that transmission, transition between palliative medicine and internal medicine so that so that our doctors in training will predominantly be doing their internal medicine in one or two settings where they will be able to develop working relationships with the teams in those places. We would usually anticipate that people will be starting their ST4 year working in palliative medicine so that they can get their feet under the table, they can, they can really get settled and begin to learn the basics. And that will often be in a hospice, not, not always, but often in a hospice. But we will then deliver the internal medicine component of the training, mostly in blocks, including a block in the final year of training, because that's a curriculum requirement. There's going to be, and there already is, a lot of regional variation in terms of how we manage those blocks. So if you're interested in training in palliative medicine and you want to find out a little bit more, we would really encourage you to talk to the, the local training program director to find out a little bit more about in the region that you're interested in, in working, about how it's going to, how it will look. And we're really committed to the training being flexible so that we can still meet the needs of trainees in terms of lesson, full-time training requirements, out of programme experience, um, and making sure that each individual trainee gets the most out of their training experience. So this is just an example about how different blocks might look. So um, on the top line, um, you'd come in following stage one internal medicine training, start in, in the ST4 year. You might then start in hospice, as I talked about already, potentially for eight months, then do a four month block in internal medicine, um, and then a further four month block in the ST5 and the ST7 year. And then throughout the palliative medicine blocks, we'll be integrating the work in hospice, hospital, and community so that people develop experience and capability across all of those settings. And then you can see from the second example that we're actually going to be delivering the general internal medicine component into six month blocks. And in between all of this, there will be keeping in touch, working both ways. So this is this is so th these are examples and there is quite a lot of local variation on it. As I said, talk to the local TPD so you can find out a little bit more about what that was that will look like um, locally.
currently our trainees have quite significant um, opportunities to do a variety of different things during their training, including um, out of programme opportunities, academic training, leadership development um, and developing areas of special interest, whether that's ethics and law or other areas. And so that will continue. So those opportunities are still going to be there. Um, and as I said, we're really committed to hoping to trying to individualise as much as possible people's training experience. Um, so that um, you know you as a trainee would get the best experience possible okay so moving on um, I think we've got uh, Liz and Diana who are going to talk to us a bit about the trainee experience thank you Thanks, Polly. Um, so, hi, my name is Liz Fleming. I'm a final year trainee up in Newcastle, so up in the North East Deanery. Um, and I have opted into doing dual training and I um, have started on the dual training curriculum this year. Um, first of all, I'm going to pass you on to my colleague, Diana, um, who is going to talk a bit about our experiences so far. Hello, everyone. Thank you, Liz. Um, so I am uh, SD4, so I just started dual training. I'm working, I'm a trainee in South London. I'm working at the moment at Croydon Hospital, so I'm doing my GIM block. Um, so like Dr Edmonds was explaining, um, depending on the region, it will be a bit different for you. Um, I started with my GIM block. I'm doing geriatrics at the moment, um, and then I'll have my eight months placement in a hospice. Um, while you're doing your GIM block, you will have to do the medical on call rotor. So you'll be the med right, um, either acute take or covering wards, whatever they, the, the hospital is offering to you at that point. Just a note that I'm doing geriatrics at the moment as a, my GIM rotation, but you guys can do um, any rotation really in any speciality for your GIM blocks, depends on the hospital and the region. Um, while you're doing your GIM block, um, we have our Keep in Touch Palliative Medicine days. So everyone does a bit different. Usually you are entitled to one day per month. In my case, I'm going to do a week uh, with the palliative medicine team here in the hospital and I'll just stay with them instead of doing uh, my ward uh, for that week and I'll do everything so I'll go with the consultants with the CNSs so you get a bit of experience even with a social worker you can get a, a bit of experience at that point um, well being the palliative medicine reg on call it's it, it's not easy doing the acute take is not easy because you will need to change your art sometimes uh, so you need to understand that the acute take you don't have as much time as you have for example for long discussions and um, that can be difficult can be hard for you but you need to understand that our input is very very precious and being able to identify patients from the front door and from that moment giving them great palliative medicine input is is precious it's, it's really really good um, and the patients are more and more complex nowadays in palliative medicine and they live longer like Dr. Edmonds was saying and so we have increased challenge with them and being able to keep up with your GIM side it's I think allows you to give a better care to complex patients in palliative medicine so I think all in all is a great experience to do the GIM block. Um, um, of course there are always loads of challenges and we were not going here just to say everything is good. Of course they are. For example, I started with my GIM block, but everyone knows that I'm an ST4 in palliative medicine. So sometimes your colleagues and your seniors might expect a bit more from you, um, even if you don't have any experience in palliative medicine. But it's okay for you to say, I did not ex uh, ex uh, start it yet and explain them your role at the moment, what you're doing. Um, it's not easy as well being a dual trainee to keep up with two curriculums um, and if having the GIM block now um, takes a year out of your palliative medicine training um, so that can be a challenge for some people I understand that some people are a bit worried about that at the moment um, but well 
I think it's still, like I was saying, being a GIM trainee and a party medicine trainee is really, really important. Um, what that is entitled to, what to do this will mean at the end for us? Well, we are not all sure yet, but we'll see with time. Um, however, I need to be very positive about it because I'm, I'm having a great experience and I think the opportunities outweigh the challenge in, in, in a lot of ways. I think it's very important, like Dr. Edmonds uh, saying, that we have our, our loads of opportunities. You can work less than full time, you can work full time, you can take a more leadership um, role or management role, you can do research, you have the opportunity now that you're doing the GM block as well to teach other people about um, what palliative medicine is and to help them or teach them to give uh, great holistic care to our patients. Um, I know palliative medicine will have loads of challenges in the future, but I think we can be all the solutions for them. And I'm really, really pleased to be a dual trainee at the, at the moment. Back to you, Liz. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so I think just to think about sort of why we chose palliative medicine, um, would it be OK to pop it onto the next slide if possible? Thank you. So, um, oh, just back one. That's it. Perfect. So, I think it's very much that although this the curriculum is changed, the principles of palliative medicine are very much the same and have not changed. And that's delivering holistic, um, individualized care, focusing on the quality of life for that person, and being able to deliver that care is a real privilege. Um, and I think it's so in palliative medicine, especially now with the challenges in the NHS, is just so key that that care remains the same. Um, I think we've touched on some of the opportunities um, with doing dual training and also with palliative medicine. So I, I think some of the things that I've found from doing my time in GIM as a palliative medicine registrar is, is one, it's made, meant that I've been able to um, build relationships with different specialities um, and that's really helped with liaison type of work that we do in palliative medicine. Um, we're able to deliver the, the palliative medicine in those other specialities and equally as Diana said we can recognise patients who may benefit from um, palliative medicine, refer them on to palliative medicine potentially earlier um, in their journey than otherwise they might have done. Some other opportunities I've had has been around mentoring, so mentoring for junior colleagues and um, giving teaching, teaching to junior colleagues, physicians, associates, um, and giving that support on war wards, which I've re really enjoyed. Um, also, in palliative medicine, there are other opportunities. So my friend's just done an UP in Uganda, um, and I found that um, the training program is very receptive and flexible and keen to support you in sort of any interest that you may have. Um, in GIM as well, doing these blocks, it might be possible that if you have a special interest in one area that you could request to do some time in that um, speciality. So, for example, um, if you have a special interest in heart failure, it might be that you could do a cardiology block and see if you could spend some time with the heart failure team. Um, and really I felt so supported not just from my palliative medicine consultants and but also from GIM consultants I think um, everyone is really um, quite excited by this and keen to make it work as much as possible and I've, I've definitely felt supported for all points in my training. Um, and you never stop being a palliative medicine registrar so even if you're on your um, I don't know, in, in cardiology, again, you're still a palliative medicine registrar, you're not a cardiology registrar, and you're there to gain as much experience that you are. And to also, you can take those holistic skills that you have into whatever speciality you choose. So 
Hopefully we've touched on some of the great things about dual training while recognising that there, there is challenges, but equally um, the Palace of Medicine as a whole is open to try and make this work as best as possible. So just to end on, again, each deanery is very unique in terms of rotations, so please contact the TPD of whatever ever area that you might be interested in training in just to ask how, how the training is done in that area. Thank you. We're just going to uh, now um, have a number of colleagues who are just going to talk to us a little bit about their experiences as palliative medicine uh, consultants and what um, the future might look like, just to give you um, a bit of an idea. So I'm going to hand over to Carol. Uh, thank you very much, Carol. Uh, good, good afternoon. Um, I have been a palliative medicine consultant for quite a long time. Indeed, I'm so old that I trained in general medicine to do palliative medicine. So I was a medical registrar and then I um, trained in oncology at Barts um, because uh, pal medicine became a specialty in 1987. So I guess in a way I've got a lot in common with the way I got into palliative medicine is not dissimilar in some ways to, to the way now, except the difference was that I had to make up my training as I went along on the palliative medicine side, which I managed to do. I've had the most amazing career. I feel so lucky. Um, I've got colleagues who've done other things who retired very early. I've retired and returned. I still really enjoy getting out of bed and going to work, um, even though I'm in, into my 60s now. And I think it's a career that you can make what you want and I, that's very much what other people have talked about so I don't want to be a stuck record but I've very much had a portfolio career. I did a lot of research, I've published a lot of papers, I've spoken all over the world um, at different conferences, I've um, done lots of different teaching, I've led sessions for the British Lung Foundation with um, breathless people with lung fibrosis and their carers. I've done so many different things and now I've a portfolio career has suited me but you may be the sort of person that wants to pick one element of that and palliative medicine is a very good launching pad for those things. I joined slightly late today because I've been um, a bit busy. I've worked in all settings, um, hospital, hospice and, co and community. Um, today I'm in the hospital and I've been to ITU and I'm going back there this afternoon to do a ward round on ITU. I've been to the cystic fibrosis ward. I've been to our Maggie Centre with a cancer patient um, to introduce them to the counselling support that's there. And I've seen a guy who's been in a hospital for 16 months, poor bloke, I won't go into details, and is going home today. It's true to say I've never been bored. So if you like lifelong learning, you never want to be bored and you want to be able to carve out your niche. I think you can, can't do far worse than palliative medicine. Thank you. Thank you, Carol. I'm just going to whiz over a couple of slides and then I think we're on to um, Andrew. Thank you. Thank you very much, Polly. So my name is Andrew Kodabakis. I'm a consultant in palliative medicine in, 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 in Liverpool um, and um, I'm going to cheat a little bit because this says a day in the life, but it's as Carol alluded to, each day is different. So I'm going to give you a bit of a theme as we as we go through. So if we move on to the next slide, you'll, I guess, I think on, on all your portfolios, obviously it'll very clearly say that there are different elements to being a, a doctor, which includes education and quality improvement and all those elements. And working in palliative medicine is extremely um, vibrant in terms of having the opportunity to share or all of that, including research, as 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 Carol mentioned, um, um, the the slides are frozen, but I can I, I can talk 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 over them. Um, I, we are a smaller specialty compared to some others, so it does give you the opportunity actually to really get involved in more than one thing, compared to some of the other spectrum, the bigger specialties, where actually you can be involved and do a lot of the clinical work, but often not have the opportunity to to get involved in some of these sessions. So you really get a really good deep overview of of things, and the beauty of working in multiple settings is often our, our, our colleagues can do, means that you're able to understand the the, the, the challenges, the opportunities that, that come from working in different in, in different different areas. Where I work in Liverpool, we've really had a, a, 
a look at how we de deliver care, ensuring that we can make sure that we provide truly integrated care. Uh, and this really is the direction of travel that we're seeing with, with health service. If you, if you see anything that's been published in the last 10 years relating to health policy, it's all very much about integrated care. Uh, and I think it's fair to say that power to medicine has been at the forefront really um, in, in developing that. Um, one of the things that um, we've done is actually look at our job plans um, and you may hear kind of from different specialties that job plans are something of a, a, a movable feast and if I reflect on what I've done in, the, in this last year I've been both in community settings integrated with, with with hospice work and also the hospital setting as as well and it's been a really great opportunity to um, actually just see the journey that people have over um the course of their 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 illness i will just bring up the slide i know things have crashed but i've got kind of the copy here so i will share that just to give you a sense of what me and four colleagues do uh in our week um so i'll just show share that through with you so hopefully people can see that have we got the red screen around it it looks like we have so I, I'm just going to show you there the, the four of the eight posts that we have within our integrated team. So headline one is, is um, our medical director of the hospice and what they do. So they do the inpatient ward round in the, in, on the Monday morning. They'll be doing a lot of the, the, the leadership and governance related to that on the Monday afternoon. Uh, then have further medical director meetings in the Tuesday and then do an outpatient clinic. Um, this person is also very significantly linked in with the educational supervision. So we'll spend some of their time on a Wednesday with their dedicated sessions with their trainees and also some of the audit that needs to, to go through and we'll participate in teaching and education throughout. This person is also a medical examiner um, and actually that's a really great skill to be able to bring that integrated view over to, to, to everyone and actually really provide that support for bereaved people and to understand how we can really improve quality of care. We do do on calls as palliative medicine physicians. I think sometimes that's not really uh, re recognised. And again, the beauty of that is that it's often a system wide on calls. So you're really able to get to grips with what's happening across different different areas. And certainly within our area, we actually do do face to face sessions on our, on our Sunday and we base that on our hospital inpatient unit that we have. And then also in our hospice inpatient unit in the in, in the afternoon. And at post two, what we do is actually we, we have time off in lieu post weekend from 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 that. Post two is someone who's got much more of a, a hospital focus. Um, and again, they'll link in both with the hospital team and reviews, do MDTs, uh, but then also kind of pick up certain specialties. So you've heard my colleagues talk about work that they've done with pulmonary fibrosis. Um, we've talked about heart failure. We've done quite a bit of work with the, with the advanced liver disease, and that's been integrated across our hospital community and, hos and hospital settings. Um, post three and four, again, more of a community approach and integrated care. Um, and I also what I want to draw on there is that for those two posts, we do have people that, that work less than full time. Um, and that is something that, again, I think palliative medicine has been really in the van vanguard of promoting and developing that to make sure that we're providing the right type of work and home integration for people. Um, as as we can, I think we've got one of the highest proportions of consultants and both trainees that work less than full time. And what it's really important is that we recognise that we need to provide that development and ongoing um, service development work alongside the clinical work, whether you work less than full time or whether you work full time, because we all have things that we can pull together and we can contribute into really getting a fantastic place to work and a fan fantastic way of developing um, really great services for people who have a huge amount of, of needs. Uh, I think we have really enjoyed our, our, our challenge of meeting the integrated care uh, agenda um, and it's also been very flexible for people within that. So there are some people who actually prefer to be in one setting rather than another and others that actually really thrive on having that integration. So as Carol mentioned just beforehand, really we're able to, 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 to draw on people's strengths and make sure we can meet people's needs in whatever seasons of life that they, that they are. Uh, please put any questions in the chat uh, and I'll hand back over to, to, to Polly to chair. 
Uh, would you like me to share the slides as well? If you if you could, that would be fine as I've crashed. So Hannah, handing over to you. Thank you. Talking about the future. Hi there. My name's Hannah Zacharias. I'm a palliative medicine consultant in Leeds. I'm going to talk today about future consultant posts and what they might look like. As has already been highlighted today, I hope you now feel really reassured. There are lots of consultant posts available now and there will be over the next 10 years. With respect to the general medicine aspect, palliative medicine has always had a large component of general medicine. So wherever you work, learning more about general medicine really won't be time wasted. I'm a college paces examiner and have always considered general medicine to be a really key part of my consulting role. There is a great diversity in jobs um, in palliative medicine, as you've been hearing about today. If you're somebody who would like to work in combination of palliative medicine and general medicine with the acute unselected take, there will undoubtedly be many emerging posts that will facilitate this over the coming years. However, it's very unlikely that many trusts will mandate GIM and acute unselected take in all of their hospital posts. Certainly, hospice and community posts are expected to largely remain unaffected by dual accreditation. However, the most important thing, as you've heard time and time again, is that no two jobs are the same. So each area, each unit has different and evolving consultant posts. There's plenty of current and future scope for dual site posts with increased collaboration across services. So that would be hospital and community or hospice and community. And even without these formal dual posts, there is so much scope for working across boundaries, which is definitely what palliative medicine does best. So for example, I am a hospice inpatient consultant currently, but I work across a big spectrum of community providers in supporting our homelessness service. And I work really closely with my hospital palliative medicine and ED colleagues in developing our service to help patients dying in the ED have access to an immediate hospice bed wherever possible. There's also a great number of specialist interests and you've heard the term portfolio career used today. I have colleagues up and down the country who've developed special interests in, for example, MND or end-stage renal disease. Lots of palliative medics are involved and interested to varying degrees with research, service development, training, university work, and you've heard about the medical examiner role. So within palliative medicine as a specialty, there are so many opportunities to have a portfolio career and to develop a job plan which really reflects your passion, not just now, but for the future as well. It's a specialty where we really embrace the idea that people's job plans, people's careers, people's interests and passions evolve over time, as do our patients' needs. I think it's a really exciting career, and I don't think I'm the only one who genuinely believes I've got the very, very best job in the world. I'll hand over for questions. Thanks, Polly. Thank you, Andrew. Could you just share the final slide, please? We've got on there the contact details for training programme directors in different parts of the country. So I don't know whether people want to take a photograph of that um, so that if they did want to follow up with more local and specific conversations, um, please do email the TPDs that are listed there. They have given per us permission to share their email addresses and are really, really happy to be approached just to talk in more detail about training in the different different regions nationally. So please do get in touch. So I'm going to open the floor to questions now. I'm going to ask my colleagues that have spoken today perhaps to put their cameras back on. Um, and we've also got Tony, who is from the IMSAC. Um, so I think Fiona has been keeping an eye on some of the questions. So I don't know, Fiona, whether it's easiest for you to kick off. I know a lot of a lot of the stuff in the chat is about people wanting a certificate. So um, I know the amazing Vicky will sort that for you. So thank you for putting your emails there. But anyway, in terms of questions, Fiona. Yep, sure. No, absolutely. The main one was lots of lots of requests for certificates. So thank you, Vicky, for sorting that one out. Um, some of the questions we've sort of answered as we've gone along, but it might just be worth bringing a few of those up. Um, one of them was a, probably a little bit more of a question around the GIM um, side of things. And when you're doing your GIM blocks, how much choice might you have in the specialty that you might be working in? Some of the answers that we've put into the chat is that it might be quite variable locally, um, how that might work. But I think certainly speaking as a TPD and working closely with our IM TPD, um, if people have got a particular preference for a type of block, then it is worth letting us know because we will try and work with that. I think depending on how big the, the, the programme is, some things might be a little bit more fixed, some things might be a bit more flexible. 
But again, Tony, I don't know if you wanted to come in on that one. Yeah, no, I think I think that is flexibility. I think that that's what the key is. Um, and you, you're all aware of the uh, mandatory requirements of uh, of 12 months of GIM, of which three months uh, has to be in the in the final year. So, um, so I, I think that that's 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 a framework uh, in which we work around. In in terms of the granularity of the type of posts, then uh, six months of of your GIM uh, has to be fully immersed in the non-parent specialty. Uh, and th therefore, it's up to the local training program and the trainee, if you like, uh, depending on local circumstances, to to pick a, a specialty that um, the trainee prefers and uh, has uh, and and uh, the local training program is able to to, to, to deliver. Um, and uh, and then the, the the other option is the, the other is that um, for three months of your uh, in of your 12 months of GIM, it can be done in an acute hospital palliative service uh, as long as you do uh, GIM on call. Um, and just also to say that um, in, in case this question comes up, and uh, Polly has mentioned this, um, in uh, three months of your GIM, uh, especially in the final year of training, um, that could the alternative to doing three months is four weeks of intensive uh, GIM in uh, in an uh, acute medical unit, for example. Thank you for that. Um, I think the one of the other questions was about how are gaps being managed. So um, I wasn't quite sure if it if the question was related to if someone's in their GIM block, how are palliative care rotor gaps being managed, or if it was vice versa. Um, I think needless to say there possibly might be some gaps, but that's for all individual sort of workforces to work out local solutions around that area. I think the overall hope is that it does make the life of a medical registrar much better if there's more people on the on the shop floor as well but again to tony i don't know if you wanted to pick that one up uh yeah so um is this about the on call um for gim so again um it, it's uh, it, it's very much uh dependent on on local arrangements um i would uh imagine certainly lo locally for example um you know that there would be blocks whenever we have a GIM palliative medicine registrar on the on call, uh, which would uh, certainly help uh, the, the GIM service in that hospital. But equally, there will be times whenever uh, that person is, is not available and the, the rotor would, would contract as, as a result. But again, th these are all uh, very much dependent on, lo on local arrangements. Thank you. Um, there was a question um, around if you're um, a doctor saying they're an immigrant doctor and their English isn't their, their first language and how would that work being a palliative medicine doctor? I think some of the chat again is absolutely that that shouldn't be a problem at all. We absolutely want to embrace that diversity and obviously our, our patients um, would, would very much appreciate that as well. And I think it's important that our workforce does does reflect our our population that we're working with as well so please don't let that hold you back if you've got any specific concerns please just get in touch locally with your local palliative care team to address any concerns um, but we'd absolutely want to um, embrace that is there anything else that anybody would want to say on that point I think, I think Diana put something in the chat didn't you Diana about <laughs> yeah so for example I'm Portuguese I study medicine in Spain and then I came to the UK um, there is no reason for you not being able to have a meaningful conversation with anyone. Do not worry about it. You'll get used to it. And if I can tell you something is try to go around with your palliative medicine team from your hospital to go to those conversations so you can learn a bit more. And you can always look for any courses because there are loads of communication skills courses which are very, very useful. Thank like you, it. Diana. Maybe Andrew. if I can come in as well, I think and within our team we have we have international medical graduates that are part of our, our our team, and I think it's important that we have a diverse workforce as we as as, as we can. Um, 
I think sometimes that, I think there is maybe some presumptions about palliative medicine services that um, are there for a certain type of person, but we see everyone from you know, the transitional care up to the, the the very old people that have been born in the UK, not in the UK. You know, we live in a very um, interesting country, I think, in terms of who we have and uh, the more people we have from diverse backgrounds, the 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 better we do. And I think certainly we're very welcoming of uh, of anyone of a particular background because it just means we can do things better. Thank you. There was another question relating to Caesar. Um, Polly, I don't know if you wanted to to take that and how that might work now. Yeah, so currently Caesars are assessed on the current curriculum. So we do have dispensation that people can still apply um, to be on the specialist register through the Caesar route single accrediting until the end of October 2024 but after that uh, the assessment will be, be based on what is our now our current curriculum which is a dual training curriculum so after October 2024 new Caesar um, applications will need to be um, a combination of internal medicine and palliative medicine. So if you are thinking about Caesar, um, there isn't that much time now left to um, gather the evidence that would be required for a single accreditation application deadline, as I said, October 2024. Thank you, Polly. There was another question relating around educational supervision. And if you're doing this, would it would you only have a palliative medicine educational supervisor that covers both? I think the answer to that is ideally you will have an IM educational supervisor and a palliative medicine educational supervisor. However, we are in the it's, it's a work in progress, I would say. So I think this will hopefully gradually happen, that that will happen for everybody. But I appreciate at the moment there might be some variation um, across the country as we find suitable um, supervisors. But yes, ideally that would be the gold standard. Um, there was a question related to more locally wanting some experience in Leeds for taster days. Hannah, I didn't know whether that person could contact you directly and you might be able to point them in the right direction. Would that be OK? Yeah, of course. Thank you very much. Um, another question related to when you become a consultant, would you have to do um, acute on calls? Um, and again, I think that probably very much as, as um, Hannah was saying in the future workforce, I think it's going to be quite varied. And so I think it depends on the consultant job that you may be doing. Um, yes, there may well be that opportunity or that expectation, but indeed also in other jobs there wouldn't be. So I think there'll be quite a diverse, well, we very much hope there'll be a diverse um, opportunity for different consultant roles in the future. Um, and I was slightly conscious as I was checking and the answers to all of those, I might have missed some of the more latter questions. So if anybody else has spotted anything else, please jump there, in. There's quite a lot about on call. Um, and then there's also. Um, I think there's I think Rachel's asked a question about sort of when you're doing your internal medicine component, what what level are you working at? Um, so, so I think I there's quite. Do you want to answer that, Liz? Yeah, so I think um, so for, I guess, for example, I've done some time as a palliative medicine registrar. I've done time in acute medicine. I've done time in gastroenterology and I've done time in cardiology as well. And I think during all those placements, um, I think when it's always good to remember that you're not a specialist registrar so you're not a specialist cardiology registrar doing a cardiology pr placement but you're still very much a registrar um, and I've been allowed to work at that level of a registrar and um, so for example I used to do clinics so I did set clinics on set days um, or if I was on the ward you would lead ward rounds or, or sometimes the consultants would do sort of like assessments with you um so even though you're you're a registrar from a different speciality you're still very much working at a registrar at that level and if you're finding that that's not the case then it would be very much raising that because that's you shouldn't be being used as an additional sho and i think in terms of on calls so when when you're in doing your gim but you're on call for as the med reg on call rota, but when you're doing your palliative medicine time, you're on call as a 
palliative medicine registrar, often covering hospices. That's what we do in the northeast, but I appreciate other areas might might be different. Um, but yeah, that's that. Hopefully, that's clarified those bits a little bit. Okay, there's a quite a specific question around doing a PhD fellowship at St Luke's and when's the best time to do that. Um, I don't know if that's worth that person getting in touch with their local TPD and just discussing that in a bit more detail if that's okay. Um, and then other questions are largely around um, But do you foresee the curriculum changes affecting the amount of trainee numbers in palliative medicine? So I think that's so that I think that might be around recruitment. And I think that's partly why we're doing this this webinar as well. So this year we have noticed that recruitment um, numbers have gone down um, and therefore that's why we're trying to address some of the concerns that might be going on. I think we're very hopeful when everything settles down that those those numbers will pick pick up again. Um, I think again, as you're saying, Polly, quite a lot of conversations about on call and how that might work in general medicine, which I think Tony has probably um, picked up by now. Was there anything else? Oh, something about getting experience. Um, we appreciate that many, many trainees may well come into palliative medicine without having actually done a done a job in palliative medicine beforehand. And that's that's quite a quite a leap, isn't it? I think if you can get some experience with with a with a local team, then that's that's helpful. But actually, we know for, for some of you that won't be possible either. So I, I've certainly got some trainees that have never had a had a palliative medicine job before coming in. And it's like everything else, you know, we we adapt and we help support you and we help you. Um, learn as much as you possibly can and feel confident in that, in that environment. So don't worry if you can't, but as I say, if you do have the opportunity, then that would be that would be the best. Can I just um, follow up on that, Fiona? Mm. Um, I mean, I, I completely agree. I think if you don't have an, an opportunity to do a short taster, it's just worth thinking about how you might just find out a little bit more about the specialty beyond today um, and think about you know how you would demonstrate your commitment to training in palliative medicine so it may be that you know talk to your local palliative care service because there may well be projects audits quip etc that you can get involved in that just give you a bit of a flavor of what we do um, and a chance to interact a bit that just gives you a better understanding in the sort of lead in then to to interview so just have a think about the things that you can get involved in that would just help support um, your application but also most importantly your understanding of the specialty um, because I think it's you know it's it's one thing isn't it for us to be talking here today and what you see on paper but it's another thing to work in it so um, but you'll find hopefully that most of your you know palliative care services are generally very um, approachable so just have a chat with um, your local palliative care team and see what they can help support you with in terms of getting a bit more direct direct experience in getting involved in projects. Thank you. I think that probably covers most of the questions that I can see. Is there anything else that we haven't covered that we can answer for you and reassure you about? in the last few minutes if if anybody just wanted to put their hand up or shout out we're obviously very happy to take a verbal question if that's easier i think hannah your email address is on that final slide isn't it for the person that was wanting to organize um a taster at uh leeds at leeds yeah and i guess the only other thing i would say is if you haven't had a chance to do any palliative medicine taster sessions and you need to learn more I mean, I'm on the TPDs up in Yorkshire, but I think we'd be people would be really the TPDs would be really happy just have a natter with you about sort of what specialist training looks like in your area because it is a bit different across the country. Um, so if you haven't had a chance to do a taster, don't don't let that put you off. Um, we'll all just happily have a chat. Um, I think Alexander's got to put a question in the chat, Fiona, about the number of posts there are going to be nationally over the next few years. Um, I mean, I think we tend to have sort of in the region of sort of 30 to 40 posts a year, sometimes a bit more. Um, so 
you say there are a fair number of opportunities year on year and we do tend to recruit in both round one and round two so round one is obviously open at the moment but round two will be open in the in the autumn so um so if you are interested um you know we think palliative medicine is a brilliant career and i think following up on what some of my colleagues have said i think most of us still enjoy coming to work um and have had fantastic varied careers and are keeping going and that's wonderful so please do talk more to your local tpd or your local palliative care team to find out a little bit more um, and hopefully today we've inspired a few of you to think a bit more about a career in palliative medicine. Um, so we'll just leave that um, slide up for a minute. Um, oh Fiona's put a question in the chat just before we finish on how will the day-to-day -day consultant work, consultant role work with GIM? Um, I think this, Fiona, this kind of links to what Hannah was talking about in terms of the fact that a lot of consultant jobs, consultant jobs are going to be quite varied in the future. So depending on kind of people's individual interests and what the opportunities are, where they want to work, um, some people undoubtedly will do hospital palliative care jobs in the future that will have an internal medicine component, potentially including um, acute take like other consultant physicians in an organisation. But there are also going to be multiple jobs in hospice, in community and some in hospital that will not have an IM component to them. So I think there's going to be enormous, um, there's going to be lots of opportunities for people to do different things. Um, and it, we're certainly not saying that every single palliative medicine consultant in the future will be doing IM as part of their consultant jobs. Some will, some won't, depending on the setting. So I think don't let the IM put you off. Please just see the IM integration now as us being better physicians to best meet the, the needs of our palliative care population. Any, did any of my colleagues that very kindly um, presented today have any final comments or thoughts just before we finish? Okay, so I think probably we'll let you all get back to work. Apologies for looking like I'm sitting in the dark. My room is actually really bright, but <laughs> that's made me look really dark. But thank you so much for your time today. Please do get in touch. Um, I say my name's Polly Edmonds. I'm on NHS Mail. So um, as chair of the SAC, if you wanted to just drop me a line, please do contact your local TPD. But we're really, really happy to follow up any specific questions that people might have. And good luck with the next phase of all of your careers. Thank you very much indeed. Goodbye.